Alors, on, on commence maintenant. Les... We will now start the webinar. I believe uh, most participants have joined the meeting. Well, let me start by welcoming you on behalf of the Inter-Committee Report on EU-Africa Trade and Investment Relations. This workshop is available in English and in French, and if you wish to choose a language, please use the world icon report on the trade and investment relations between Africa and the European Union. We have English and French translation. You can switch the languages by uh, pushing the little globe symbol on your Zoom screen. My my name is Arif Ruzgar. I work for the Brussels office of the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. For those of you who are not aware of what Rosa Luxemburg Foundation is, it is a foundation, a political foundation close to the political party called Die Linke, it's a German organization. Our office in Brussels is working on internal and external issues relating to European policy. And in this respect, we also work on trade and investment relations. And we've already done a great deal of work concerning trade and investment relations between the EU and the African continent, including in the framework of the EU ACP partnership agreement. There have been uh, there has been some criticism regarding those partnerships or these uh, these uh, agreements regarding the ideology of free trade ideology and other issues. I'd like to welcome you on what is the second part of a series of workshops. This time we are going to focus on the relationship between the European Union and West Africa. And this is certainly going to be very interesting because some important developments have taken place in West Africa recently. There has been a coup, a coup in Mali and Guinea and also in Burkina Faso late and within this framework, it will certainly be very interesting to hear what ECOWAS thinks about this and what is the impact of these events on the relations between the EU and West Africa. Of course, we will also take into consideration the historic relations which existed from the colonial time. We have a unitary money currency, the French CFA franc in part of West Africa. And I'd like to insist on closing the meeting at a very, uh, very sharply at 1930, because this evening at 8 p.m. we have a football game between Senegal and Burkina Faso. It's the semi-final of the African Nations Cup, Football Cup, and I'm quite certain that participants from West Africa would like to watch the game, and therefore we certainly need to finish our meeting in good time. I'd like to thank you all for being here, and I would now like to give the floor to the monitor, the moderator of this meeting. The moderator is MEP, Mr. Helmut Scholz, who is also a member of the Inter Committee of the European Parliament, and he is actually in charge of the report which I've mentioned earlier 
on the EU-Africa trade and investment relations. Thank you very much. Helmut Scholz, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Florian Horn, for the introductory remark and for the opening of this very challenging and interesting webinar. I'm really glad to have distinguished guests with me in the in this round uh, of discussing aspects um, of the, um, um, how to say it, um, West African developments. And um, not to add additional remarks to that what Florian already introduced, I will explain a little bit the aim of this webinar. Uh, the International Trade Committee uh, has, on behalf of the European Parliament, taken the responsibility to, uh, to work on an initiative report marking the um, perspectives of the trade and investment relations between the EU and Africa after it has adopted already uh, its own report on the um, Africa um, um, agenda uh, 2020 and ahead of accompanying the forthcoming EU Africa Summit in just two and a half weeks uh, in Paris, which is happening in a very challenging time. Uh, because we as international trades have said, we take knowledge about the um, uh, efforts of various African countries of the African Union to, uh, to push forward an own economic agenda for the whole continent by creating the AFCFTA, so a, a comprehensive customs union, a comprehensive trade and economic cooperation area, which is, of course, uh, giving us a lot of stuff to thinking about in which way this will affect the different regions, uh, the regional cooperation, like ECOWAS, like the Eastern African community, like the S SADC in the southern part of Africa. So, I mean, this is, of course, a new stage. And of course, uh, we, we have knowledge about different experience in shaping the relations between the European Union and Africa. But Africa is probably the continent of the future. And uh, there will be, uh, within 20 years, uh, a huge growth of the inhabitants uh, in your countries, uh, in the regions of Africa, and that will raise even more challenges and probably also social, political, economic, cultural aspects and challenges to us. So we are working on this trade report, on the report dealing also with investments, and knowing that there is foreseen for the Paris summit uh, EU-Africa summit, um, um, an agreement on huge investments, um, a huge um, package on economic developments. We want to listen to different stakeholders, being it from the business sector, being it from the ECOWAS structure, being it from the civil society uh, and the civil, uh, civil society organized um, um, NGO scene, trade unions. What do you expect? What are your uh, problems? What are your visions? And therefore, we call the series of webinars having started last week with East Africa, today with West Africa, coming to South and Northern Africa in, under the title In a Listening Mood. So I don't want to speak a lot uh, about our approach. Uh, I have invited my colleague, Vice President of the European Parliament, Pedro um, um, Silva Pereira, to be with us. He is much more than me uh, familiar with the developments in, in Western Africa, because he is also the permanent and standing rapporteur on the ECOWAS. So um, in this way, uh, it is um, really, a, really a pleasure for me. And he will give them the comments from the European side. But first, I want to uh, give the floor to our guests from Western Africa. I can also inform you that we have the permanent rapporteur for the SADC with us, um, uh, um, Joachim Schuster, and we have the former interchair listening to us. 
uh, who is already retired here from the European Parliament, um, um, uh, active uh, responsibilities, but Dr. Helmut Markov is also with us and listens to us. So a uh, uh, quite uh, uh, good issue. And of course, I'm happy that a lot of other uh, followers for our seminar are with us. So I would ask in the beginning, there is one cross-cutting question probably. What evaluation in trade and investment relations is needed to achieve the sustainable development goals? How do these changes relate to the achievement of the foreseen implementation or bringing in, into move of the African um, comprehensive trade trade area? And I would like uh, in the beginning to give the floor to Dr. Ken Ukawa from the National Association of Nigerian Traders and ask him how do develop trade and investment relations between you and Africa for the benefit of the people in West Africa. So for 10 minutes, uh, Dr. Ukawa, the floor is yours. Hey, um... Thank you very much, Mr. Um, Shores. I want to start by sharing uh, this very privilege to be part of uh, this process and this discourse. I will not take it for granted. Thank you so much for that. Also, um, you know, commending the vision. Uh, you know, behind the idea, behind this concept, and the team really resonates in my ears so soundly, so strongly, you know, uh, listening mode, that speaks volume, listening mode. Uh, it tells me that a new thing is coming in place. It tells me that Hitatu, there may have not been enough listening but now there are ears to listen to the cries of Africa. It really tells me quite a lot that there is preparedness for the two, for the parts to come to the table and um, look at what can be done to structurally uh, bring about development and a win-win kind of framework between the two parties. Having said this, I'm just hoping that the results will be uh, uh, you know, seen as um, a commendable listening uh, outcome. And uh, one of the reasons I must say for the failure of past uh, approaches, or if you like, poor performance of past approaches in terms of trade and investment between the two parties, the EU on one side and the Africa on the other side, is uh, permit me what I would say. I'm going to be very blunt. I hope you wouldn't mind. Um, one of these reasons is the kind of master-servant this down. Master-servant attitude of negotiators, or even the power bearers, who still believe and portray negotiations as if there is a colonial you know, I mean, that colonial mentality is still there. My apologies. Uh, then seeing Africa as hewers of wood and fetchers of water and having no respect for fundamental human rights, knowing that these people must develop at some point. Now, I don't know how 10 minutes is going to help me in doing this, but I'm going to be, I'm going to try as much as possible. But number one is that if we are going to develop an investment trade investment relationship that will benefit both parties, one is the appreciation of the people of West Africa. Appreciation of one, where they are coming from. Appreciation of these people as human beings as well. Appreciation of their fundamental, you know, rights to exist and to avoid the temptation of putting that master-servant relationship uh, you know, in the process of negotiations and recognizing and negotiating from a development-oriented perspective. That's very key. Two is the understanding that trade 
and its outcome must be a win-win. And therefore, the negotiators must carry that in their mind that whatever outcome must be a win-win, not one party outscoring the other. It is not a football match where one wins and then goes off. No, have in mind that particular win-win strategy and maintain the gear. Number three is on the issue of the recognition of a poor and pro-development approach that recognizes as well the special and differential treatment provisions of the WTO. This is very important. As we negotiate, very key. Understand that there is a paradigm shift. There is a gap in terms of development. And therefore, there must be some standard, you know, where this other side will not be given the short end of the road. The other one is having the, in mind that all of us gathered together at the level of the United Nations, and this is my number four, at the level of the United Nations, to talk about the MDGs, which is today Sustainable Development Goals. Now, in these goals, the agenda must, therefore, in all our trade negotiations, in all our investment negotiations, must carry in mind those particular bullets, those particular points that SDGs eminently incorporated, and therefore leaving no one behind. Number five. Number five is the recognition that foreign direct investments from the EU to West Africa would promote the protection of the EU's investments by the people, by the people. Because, you know, the understanding that the volume of employment, I mean, uh, employment that comes up from such investments on this side of West Africa, if the people understand it, if West Africans understand that there is a volume of investment, I mean, of employment that comes up from these investments from the EU, then they will seek to protect it. They will see it as their own and they will take ownership of every design and the process of trade and investment negotiations. Number six. Number six for me is the importance of both parties supporting each other, particularly the European Union supporting West Africa at international fora, at all international negotiations, knowing that there is a relationship and that relationship would give that support. And if West Africa understands that there is a regular support coming from this end, then the respect will be there. Number seven. Number seven is subjecting the processes of trade negotiations to parliamentary reviews, regular parliamentary reviews. I, I, I am happy that this is a parliament, uh, you know, member of parliament, in fact, a parliamentary committee raising this matter, trying to review, trying to understand what has gone wrong, what, where are we, what can be done. And therefore, recognizing the power of the members of parliament presupposes that they should be part and parcel of negotiations right from the beginning to its end. In fact, given the role of the members of parliament in oversight function, it also proposes that they should be part and parcel of it, even in implementation, so that they can oversight and also monitor and evaluate outcomes. Number seven for me, uh, number eight rather, is provide the provision of you know, financial support to West Africa wherever and whenever necessary. I know that EU is, uh, you know, a very, um, you know, a good partner in this, in this supportive partner. But I think that there is also the opportunity to move a bit further in this direction, especially now that we have the African continental free trade. I am expecting, I am watching, I am wanting to see the European Union providing more support 
for Africa's integration so that Africa can come together as a regional bloc. And therefore, if a regional bloc with a common external tariff and therefore with a custom union, and it makes it easier for European Union to integrate the people and trade and investment can flow better. Number nine. Number nine for me is listening to the non-state actors as you know, often as possible. Not just trade must not be seen as a government versus government thing, including the negotiations, including the negotiations thereof. Private sector, labor unions, civil society have a vital voice that must be listened to. And from time to time, I expect that both parties must therefore improve the listening ear, just like the listening mood that is being you know, kickstarted now. These voices are very critical. And therefore, handholding of private sector is very monumental in this process. Number 10. I don't know whether, I, whether number 10 or so now, you know, I, I'll just keep moving, but I'm looking at my time. Um, the, the, the next is being patient with West African partners and their processes. And I want to quickly say that why the EU have almost, you know, had almost all their policies harmonized. You have your services policy, you have your trade policy, you have your common, uh, you know, uh, intellectual property policy, you have common investment policy, you have common almost in every subsector. But if you come here in West Africa, just like is in many, many other African countries, you will see that even some countries don't have policies. Some countries don't have policies. In fact, in Nigeria today, I'm in Nigeria. Nigeria today, we're fighting in words here, is the absence of a trade policy. And therefore, if we should have, if we should negotiate, I have said this often, if we should negotiate as a bloc, we should also move from having our internal trade policy to a regional common trade policy. Because that is the only way you will have, you know, a compass that will navigate your negotiations properly and seeing clearly, like, you know, the pilot at the aircraft. The next point is avoiding the destruction, I mean, destructive power of uh, deadlines, insistence on deadlines. One of the things that crumbled negotiations that I have been part and parcel of, and by the way, I have to say this, myself and uh, Sheikh, I've seen uh, Dr. Sheikh here, who were part of the negotiations of the economic partnership agreement between the two sides. And one thing that I saw was, you know, the insistence on deadlines. No, deadlines are meant for human beings. Deadlines are meant, you must not you try and make sure that these people have some time to roll themselves in, just like I said earlier, that they don't have common policies. Give them some time to also harmonize their policies. Don't look strictly on the deadlines. The next point for me is measuring the outcomes, and this is very important for me, measuring the outcomes of our negotiations on trade investment. Very monumental. If I look at the Cotonou Agreement, for instance, which is the mother and the father of the EPA, for instance, there, are, there is a tripod objective. One, regional integration. Two, poverty reduction. Three, sustainable development. And therefore, whatever we negotiate on trade and investment within that context must be judged or measured within the benchmark of these three objectives. Unfortunately, today, I must say that looking at EPA as an example, what we have seen is a rather disintegration of West Africa. Today, we have the EBA for the 12 member countries of uh, Unifrag and all that, the least developed countries in West Africa. Number two, we have the interim agreement for, for Cote d'Ivoire. Number three, we have the interim agreement arrangement for Ghana. Number four, we have Nigeria, you know, uh, 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 GSP. So how do you operate? And you are negotiating with religion. That's a bit, a bit, a bit off. So 
So I think that we must measure within the template of regional integration, 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 and integration. How is our immigration outcome and process bringing about integration to the people? Very important. How much poverty is it reducing? Very important. How much sustainable development is being put on the table for the people? Very key. And I want to also submit that, you know, we need to, as I conclude, we also need to consider, and this might be very frank and brutal, we must begin to consider mode four of trade is, although there was no negotiations on that, but mode four, very critical. When I look at the needless death of African youths, majority of them from West Africa, dying along the Mediterranean, who are seeking for visa to come over, seeking you know, greener pastures, and they die over there in thousands. Hey, I ask myself, yes, I'm, 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 I'm almost done. I ask myself, is there no possibility that we are negotiating trade? We are negotiating trade, but can we also, in the interest of trade, in the light of trade, in the light of this development, negotiate in a way that these people would have a secure life. These people will have an easy movement. This is very, very important. Finally, I want to thank you again and uh, say that um, we must begin to look at what China is doing in Africa today. Although many of us are not happy completely, but MP, please, when you look at the monuments, airports, schools, malls, you know, and these are things that are there, visible monuments that will be there over years, you now begin to ask yourself, with the European Union that we have stayed for many decades, what are the monuments that are in place? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ukawa for this introduction. Yeah, I mean, interesting and, and problems raising introduction from, from Africa. So I would immediately give the floor to Dr. Sheikh Tidiane Die. Welcome also to our panel this evening. You are one of the negotiators for the IPA. So you have heard just now a third message and it would be interesting to listen to you. How do you judge the situation where we are and also in the relationship uh, uh, to the uh, AFCFTA and probably also how to implement UN SDGs uh, in, um, in, in the East, uh, in, in, in the ECOVAX um, structure and where we are with the trade and investment relations between West Africa and the European Union. The floor is yours, Dr. Sheikh. Thank you very much um, for inviting me to this uh, workshop. I'm very happy joining you for this discussion on this uh, issue, which is very important both for Africa and Europe, as we are all uh, uh, working to change in order to reinforce the uh, Africa-EU relations, but in, a, in, in, in new uh, dynamics and new uh, approaches, because a lot of things have to change. If you allow me, I would like to move into French uh, to make my, uh, my remarks, as I see that there are interpretation and I'm more comfortable on, in French. Uh, donc, merci beaucoup, uh, uh, mesdames et messieurs, pour uh, uh, m'avoir associé à cette... Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for having invited um, me to take part in this discussion. Très, très important pour nous de... It is of utmost importance to take part in this discussion and to contribute to it. You have mentioned the fact that I was part of uh, the regional negotiation body uh, which negotiated be between the EU and West Africa for the A EPA, and I represented the civil organization. And I wish to recognize here my colleague, uh, Dr. Ken Ukawa, with whom I've worked for many years. 
Now, when we talk about relations between Africa and the EU, we have to mention economic partnership agreements. They, I put it in the plural because there are several EPAs and some agreements are actually signed with specific uh, countries with specific objectives, with specificities, etc. You may remember that things uh, started in 1992, then in 2003, and the EU had split up the African continent in five subregions, which was a problem for the civil society because it was very difficult to understand that an agreement which was there to strengthen the African capacities and which was there to have a regional approach and to make regions stronger it was bizarre to start with a split up. We had uh, a one West Africa, ECOWAS plus uh, um, Mauritania. Then we had uh, SEDEC. Uh, we had different, uh, five different regional areas, which all negotiated an EPA with the EU. But then what have we been able to observe? Well, there's something quite specific, and that is that the agreement was actually these agreements were very long in their duration this was a one-off uh, it was a very long it, a very long process it was very complex and now why was it why did it take so long why was it so complex well because europe had actually demands which were just unacceptable and not sustainable for the african economies and in addition to that for the first time africa became fully aware of the importance of its economic and uh, social relationship with europe and africa decided it was not just going to take what Europe was going to give it, it decided to negotiate on an equal footing. And that is where the civil society played a major role all through these negotiations. It is possible to block the negotiations. Just to give you an example of the excessive demands on behalf of the EU, you know that the EU was uh, saying and claiming that it was going to fight uh, poverty, but this is just phraseology. We know that free trade does not bring this fight against poverty, etc. Now, Europe had excessive demands on Africa, and at the same time, we had actually asked for this agreement so that we would comply with the rules of the World Trade Organization. And instead of limiting oneself to what was required by the WTO, the EU decided to go for a so-called comprehensive agreement, which was going to cover the uh, free trade of goods plus uh, investment plus uh, intellectual property, etc., and lots of other things which was not truly necessary to be compliant with what was requested by the WTO. And Europe's mission was actually to include a clause, um, how do you call it, um, a clause specific to emerging countries. This was Article 15, which provided that everything that Europe would provide to emerging countries, it would also be provided to uh, the uh, to all nations who benefited from the preferential, from the generalized system of preferences. In fact, this was a specific clause which the EU wanted to integrate, but Africa refused because they understood it was a no-go. Now, speaking about West Africa, out of 16 countries of West Africa, i.e. 15 of ECOWAS plus Mauritania, 12 of those countries were amongst the least developed countries, i.e. these least developed countries were not obliged, according to the WTO agreement, to open up their borders, and yet in the EPA, the EU considered that had to be done. This was not acceptable. What it means is that from 2003 until 2014 or 2015, 
the agreement was negotiated but for West Africa there was no comprehensive agreement as the EU wanted. Oh, the result was that there was a total disintegration of West Africa. Now, having said that, the West African region now has five different trade regimes because uh, you have the situation of Côte d'Ivoire. There is an EPA with Côte d'Ivoire. There's one with Ghana. There is the generalized system of preferences with uh, Nigeria. There is the uh, provision of everything but arms with other uh, countries and yet another trade regime that far too many uh, regimes, trade regimes for one area. And so the EU was claiming that they were going to harmonize things. Well, quite the contrary happened. In fact, it was very, very complicated. And in other parts of Africa, some countries which were LDCs have been put in jeopardy. Now, I just wanted to say a few words concerning the interim agreement, the interim EPA with Côte d'Ivoire and that with Ghana. In fact, Côte d'Ivoire had already uh, signed uh, an interim agreement in 2007, whereas this did not happen. Well, in fact, it happened on 26th of November 20. Uh, 2008. It was then ratified in 2016. Now, since 2019, Côte d'Ivoire has started opening up its market for goods coming from the EU. Now, in this dismantling of uh, the Côte d'Ivoire market, some 1,555 tariff headings are relating to goods that come from EU without having to pay any tariffs. We're talking about equipment, appliances, uh, raw materials, etc. And they can arrive on the Côte d'Ivoire market and they don't have to pay any taxes, any rights. This will have an impact at regional level because countries such as Mali or Burkina Faso, which receive a lot of imports from Côte d'Ivoire, and they are presently wondering whether the products that arrive from Côte d'Ivoire are actually products which have benefited from the liberalization linked to the EPA, and they arrive on the markets of uh, Mali or Burkina Faso, but then they become competitive with a lot other products. So this is absolutely not compliant with the aim which was being followed. and. As of 2024, you know that there's a liberalization for a second type of goods which will take place in Côte d'Ivoire, and this will have a major impact for the imports coming from Côte d'Ivoire to other countries of the region. I'm not saying that other countries in the region are from now on going to refuse any imports from Côte d'Ivoire, but it's completely changing the face of ECOWAS because all these European products coming from the EU arriving in Côte d'Ivoire also benefit from different rules regarding the rules of origin. And in Ghana, since January of 2018, Ghana has ratified an interim EPA with the EU, and presently Ghana is seeking some technical solutions in order to do the same as Côte d'Ivoire was doing. Now, what we're wondering is the following. The African countries, I'm limiting, I'm limiting this to African countries, not notwithstanding ACP countries, but in the African continent, you have a lot of these developed countries who cannot be winners if they sign an EPA. It is not in their interest to liberalize their markets because the LDC countries already have some provisions. So in addition to that, they are asked to liberalize their markets, but nothing is done in terms of investment, in terms of capacity building, in terms of uh, building industry, etc. So these are the essential questions which the African countries are continuing to 
ask themselves, and this is why there is no EPA at West African level. And we, representatives of the civil organization, we had worked in order to try and counter the EPA at regional level. We succeeded. There was no regional EPA for West Africa because the West African has understood, thanks to Nigeria and thanks to the civil society, thanks to the private sector, that you cannot open up your markets for up to 75% to products from the EU because Africa does not have capacity to sustain this. And in addition to that, we cannot just continue as we are. Europe is actually continuing committing errors, one mistake after the other. Europe is just not seeing that the EPA model is a failure. The EPA model is a failure. Nothing was done to strengthen integration. Nothing was done in order to develop local capacity, local production capacities. And in fact, the EPAs have led to problems in terms of trust between the Europeans and the Africans, because the Africans realized that had Europe been able to reach its objective, certainly uh, regions and countries would have signed EPAs in 2008. But I'd like to remind you that in 2008, ECOWAS did not have a common policy of outside tariff. And yet the EU was pressing the ECOWAS and West Africa to sign a regional EPA. That would certainly not have been appropriate at the time ECOWAS did not have an agreement regarding tariffs. Now, sectoral policies. Yes, agricultural policy is being implemented, but there are no other policies that are being set up in Africa that could sustain investments and production activities. I believe what is necessary to do is to first set up these possibilities, set up a common tariff at regional level, strengthen the private sector in Africa, give the right conditions to Africa, and then negotiate agreements, not only with Europe, but with whoever wishes to appropriately trade with African countries. That has not been done. The cart was put before the horses. Now, what can we do today? We have to draw some lessons. The first lesson is that the uh, civil society has already told the EU that they have to look for other options. Europe continues pushing the EPAs and trying to implement EPAs, but Europe itself has changed. I will finish in one minute. Since Brexit, the nature of Europe has changed. Europe has negotiated with ACP countries, with Africa, then uh, the UK left for that the negotiations took place when the EU was made of 28 countries. So things have changed. Then since an agreement of post after Cotonou has taken place, this has also changed the relationships between Europe and Africa. And this has to be taken into consideration by Europe. And thirdly, Africa is presently setting up an African continental free trade area. This is a very ambitious project. If the EPAs are being set up before the FCFTA is set up, it will be very difficult for the African continental free trade area to develop because EPAs could actually have a negative impact on this African continental free trade area. And finally, I'd just like to remind you of the uh, COVID-19 pandemics where although countries are trying to find policies uh, to develop and redevelop, these countries need actually to have a margin of maneuver. They should not be forced to respect the EPA agreements of liberalization. So I just wanted to mention this. But to end, let me say that Europe needs to change its approach vis-a-vis -vis Africa. It needs to change its strategy, its priorities, and the way it deals with Africa. 
let alone the state of mind, because paternalistic behavior continues on behalf of the uh, European diplomacy and on behalf of the European relations. And this means there is a great deal of misunderstandings. This is what I wanted to say in the first part. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Sheikh Tidian and Dia, for this also, um, how to say it, a focused uh, point of view on the EPA um, with ECOWAS. And uh, that leads me not to waste too much time for uh, own comments, uh, to give the floor to um, Mr. Wendel Adi uh, from the Pan-African Chamber of Commerce. Very happy to have you with us because last time it was just short uh, when you could follow the East African um, uh, community uh, webinar, but today the uh, floor is yours. I have to unmute, please. We lost you. Do you hear me? Yeah, yeah I can hear you. Yes. yes. My apology. My colleagues have touched on a key area. So I would not dwell on statistics, but I'll focus on how we can galvanize the private sector to become functional and uh, empower them in a way that uh, we can bring about some stability across the continent. Uh, right now, we have four African countries caught up in coups out of 15 or 16 countries. That's terrible. We do not know uh, Mr. What Eddie, uh, sorry for interrupting. Can you in include your camera? Because otherwise the translation will not function. I'm afraid that, uh, OK, you got me? Yes. All right. So I'm, basically I was saying that we have to look at it from a different perspective in terms of a galvanized uh, stakeholder uh, base in terms of constituency from the private sector begin to co up the role of the co op and the activities of government so that we can have a more stable, more functional governance situ situation across the country that provides uh, peace and stability. Private sector cannot thrive in the midst of all of the chaos that exists currently. And so that's the focus of uh, my presentation. I'll be in the interest of time, I will just skim it through, but would uh, send you the hard copy, the soft copy, pardon me. My focus is EU Africa policy and program reset for mutual prosperity with focus on West Africa. But in context, I'll be speaking generally about the continent. I represent the private sector AP, APSS organization, a think tank body that works with and governize private sector and partner stakeholders like the Pan-African Chamber of Commerce and Industry, African Business Council, Manufacturer Association, Labor Organization, Association of African Universities, Consumer Organization, Civil Organization for Common Cause Advocacy for Action to Influence Change for an Enabling Business Environment in Africa. We are currently working on the Bill of Rights advocating for government's commitment for an enabling business environment. We seek a business environment that is characterized by the tenets of peace, stability, rule of law, embedded with predictability under which domestic and foreign investors can thrive. We seek to identify key policy and program enablers that would enhance and accelerate the implementation of the regional economic communities, such as ECOWAS and AFTA protocols for real inclusive economic growth and development. Personally, as my personal thing, I'll come back to that. But first, in the context of West Africa, the EU policy on partnership agreement, having concluded in 2014 with 16 countries of the region through ECOWAS economic community of West Africa and UMWA. The 
In 2020, West Africa EU exports accounted for some 22.4 billion euros, while EU West Africa was 25.8 billion. As such, the EU remains one of the West Af one of West Africa's largest trading and strategic partners. Therefore, should the EU seek to increase trade between the two regions, it must relook really at its policies directed at engaging and strengthening the private sector membership organization from both regions with the goal of greater collaboration for identification of new business opportunities while facilitating experience share, sharing and build to build the capacity of private sector membership organization chamber of commerce business associations led by the pan-african chamber of commerce and industry and the newly established african business council to to the African Union, academic institutions led by the Association of African Universities, Labor Society Organization in West Africa and the continent. Basically, we're saying that we need to work with these institutions, empower them. That is, the EU should begin to look at these uh, constituency based institutions so that collectively we can begin to bring about some. Uh, accountability in governance across the continent. There are key areas that we're looking at. One, the private, the private sector bill of rights is key for an enabling business environment. It provides for accountability it provides for recognition of the role of the private sector because most in most African countries, the, the private sector happens to be in, uh, an afterthought. Nobody thinks about it. Government officials engage in the dialogues with the EU, all right? And at the end of the day, there is no consideration in terms of the input of the private sector. Oftentimes you find that when you had the validation situation required in the DAC agreement with the with the EU, for example, World Bank and other other governments, you will find meetings are held between government officials and and the uh, and the uh, the foreign entity, and the private sector usually just call in to sit, listen to what they have committed the country to. And then they consider it as a validation process. We think that process has to change, and that is that would be in the mutual interest of the of the uh, of both the EU and the uh, and the government. So, in essence, what we're saying here going forward, part of this mutual prosperity has to come about in terms of the uh, uh, partnering, including the partnership of the private sector in this dialogue with government. It should no longer be just government sitting at the table. The private sector has to be at the table because at the end of the day, when when the disruption, what is uh, civil civil unrest caused because of the governance issue, whether it is uh, an aspiring desiring to extend his term, whatever the situation is, it is the private sector that takes the brunt of the, the of the uh, of the event as well as the people. Okay, because the people take to the street and they destroy uh, the private uh, the businesses and so forth. So I think it is time that the private sector be uh, included in some of these discussions with uh, uh, in these negotiations. Now, the, there is also another key issue here. You cannot talk about education, I mean, uh, uh, after, for example, without recognizing the, the critical role that academia has to play. So as tomorrow, for example, we'll be commissioning a trust fund, an African educational trust fund. What we're looking at is that development in, on the continent cannot occur without academia. So what we were able to do late in March of last year was to bring academia and the Pan-African Chamber of Commerce together and say, look, let us work together. You provide the skill sets demand for the workforce for the continent. We will then find a way to help to, uh, to provide the jobs. All right. 
So what we're saying here is that uh, uh, the trust fund is, crit is critical to revamp the educational system uh, at university levels and uh, TVET levels so that, uh, that the skill sets the workforce can be provided across the continent. We also think that this particular uh, aspect of what we're doing is critical because it will help to empower many of our people who are now trying to migrate to West, I mean, to Europe and other places, greener pasture, greener pasture. We think this is very important. And I, this is something that uh, the EU should begin to look at. If we provide the skill sets for the people of the continent, transform the, the resources of the continent, people will have better paying jobs, the, the, the development will be accelerated and people would uh, be more uh, receptive to staying uh, within the continent because they have, they have jobs, they can send their children to school and all of that. You know. So what we, then there's the issue of uh, visas. Let's some, uh, Dr. Ken referenced China, you know, and I'd like to share a story with you. China in 1987, you recall this, the crisis of 1987, that is when that very period is when China started the, the, uh, to look at a new market. What had happened? What happened was that China, India, most of the Asian countries had reached their, their, their quota system limits with the US. They had excess goods sitting down. And so China decided to invest $5 billion to look at new market. That new market was Africa. Today, they're ripping the, 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 the investment. This is how China started. Now, what is critical here? Think about this. Any street peddler can obtain a visa to go to China. Any street peddler can obtain a visa to go to China. In to travel to Europe, the States, it's a different ball game. Even some of the wealthiest are denied visa. Wealthiest business people are denied visa to come to, to, the, to travel to Europe or to the States. So this is why you find that people go to China much easily because and come back, get their goods, sell. So if, if Europe and the West will begin to look at this, this visa issue from a business perspective, all right, you can put in all of your regulation and policies into play. All right, for example, in 2000, I think it was in two, I used to serve as an active member of the, of the consumer movement in, in Africa. I'm one of the founders of that movement. And what we, what we came up with, we had problem, many of our, we, every three years is the Consumer Congress. We had we had a congress in the, in France, Montpellier, France, and those who attended, many of the leaders who attended the conference in France, had problem obtaining visas. You know, in in, in Ghana, the, the the president of the consumer movement they was kicked thrown out of the compound, the embassy's compound. Similar thing happened in the in the with the in the Nigeria. But what we're saying here, there can be a system, and I recall that in two thousand we came up with a waiver system where obtaining a visa, you waive your rights for any legal, uh, for change of status, as well as any legal challenge. So that, that is something that you sign before you get, you get a visa. So forth. that was the concept that we're about to put forward at the ECOSOC and the, at the, uh, at the UN. Unfortunately, 9-11 took place and so that became a back, a back burner thing. We're also trying to, we're now looking at each whole, the issue of democracy. The traditional method that had been used to advance democracy in Africa has failed miserably. Oftentimes you have situations where an organization goes into a country, identify an, an advocate uh, who, would, uh, who has been advocating for change and so forth and they fund the organization. What is missing here is that this organization or such organization usually do not have uh, a constituency base link. Okay, so what we're saying now that the private sector can help to advance democracy. 
And you can only do so by looking at those organizations with strong constituency base. The university, the Association of African University has a strong constituent base. You have the professors, you have the student body. The Chamber of Commerce and other business associations have, a, have constituent base. You have members of the, of the, the organization, all right, that, they can that the leadership can turn to because the leaders were collected by these people, all right? So you have the, the, you have the uh, labor union. The labor union has a constituent base. The last that I checked, there are some, uh, uh, I think 15,000 uh, workforce racial members of the union across the continent. If you add the, the, the non-union members, you talk of probably maybe 50 million people, all right? So we need to begin to look at democracy from the standpoint of strengthening these organizations at the, at the, at the uh, empower them so that we have the skill sets to administer the activities to ensure that we can advance democracy across the continent. So about, about the advancing the initiatives here, we're talking about the universities, we're talking about uh, Chamber of Commerce and all of the various businesses, associations, we're talking about labor unions across the continent, we're talking about uh, CSOs, and so forth. So we, look, we need to look at it from a constituency base so that together we can co-opt the politicians. We can call for strong governance policy. We can talk, we can engage the EU, the, the ECOWAS and all of these regional bodies that we need to ensure that we have to, uh, 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 stability across, across the continent so that businesses can thrive and provide solution for the migration of, uh, to counter the migration issue that are taking place ac across the continent. Another area that can be addressed is me, the private sector representation, the organization with regional and continental, in the continental in implementation of, of uh, uh, EU funded programs, not just the EU, it could be America, it could be UN, whoever. What is important here is that oftentimes you find that uh, funds are giving, end up with government, all right, and you do not get the end results of the of the of your investment. So what we're saying, for example, is that EU funding, if it is going through the UNDP, for example, and it is and is being administered or coordinated through a government entity involve the Chamber of Commerce, involve the private sector, so that they can help to provide some real accountability in the process. Lastly, I, I will send you the, the paper, but lastly, when we talk, we need to talk about uh, the relationship between the private sector and government. It is important. We find here that oftentimes, uh, government, as, as a result of bad governance, all right, run to foreign institution or into multilateral institution for loans, whether the, the, the African uh, banks, for example, the African Development Bank, or whether it is the, the African Bank, they run to these organizations to, to build them out of their, their economic crisis. But the reality of the ground is that the people who are who ultimately are the payer of these obligations happen to be the private sector. That is the ground reality. The government's ability to pay its bill is determined by the, the, the function of the private sector. So technically, the government's revenue is a function of the performance of the private sector. Now, if the, if, the if the government policy is bad, secondly, the government, the private sector will not thrive very well and the government will, would not be able to pay its bill. So what we're saying now is that they built the health of the relationship between the private sector and the, and the, and the public sector must be a factor, just as they currently have a situation now where 
uh, the uh, environment is a factor in, in determining the public sector lending. Gender balance is a factor in determining public sector lending. We're saying now the health of the relationship between the private sector and the govern government must be one of the determining factor in extending loans to the to the public sector. Um, I think that my, one of my colleagues, I think Dr. Kent uh, talked about uh, the migration issue. I think that uh, if we can build a strong private sector by supporting, you know, I think this is where uh, uh, one of the mistakes that uh, Western countries are making, and that's why China has uh, uh, an advantage, is that if you ask anyone to prefer uh, uh, products out of Europe, out of the States and so on, but they get it cheaper at, in China. Whether it work for two days or three days is not an issue. They can they have access to the product. So I think uh, it, is, it is in our mutual interest that we also include supporting consumer movements across the country. It's a UN requirement, it's a UN resolution that all countries must have a consumer movement. Okay, I recall when we came up with a modern, a, a modern law, consumer protection law back in the uh, 1997, uh, I, I've, I stand corrected on the name. I think her name was Erna Pernito. She represented the EU, the EU. She was one of the commissioners. She represented the EU in commissioning that uh, model law for Africa. Unfortunately, because Africans do not understand the importance of consumerism, that it, it has not really taken off across the continent. So I think we need to revisit uh, Mr. Eddy, we have you have to come to uh, to find to the end. Huh? We have no time. Well, well, I thank you. Basically, we think to you, please let's focus on empowering the Chamber of Commerce, the the uh, Association of African University, the labor organizations, but they have money because they have membership dues uh, greater than, than the Chamber of Commerce and that the CSO, so that together we look at this the constituency based body to help to transform the continent so that we can slow down this military takeover across the continent. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Eddy. Unfortunately, we are running out of time. So to have all the speakers um, given the, 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 the really the ability to to put us in a listening mood and to speak out what they want. Uh, I will give now immediately the, the floor to Dr. Ndomgo Sambasila. Um, please try to keep at least 10 minutes so that uh, also uh, our vice president from the European Parliament has a chance to respond to you and all the others with the questions. I have already a list of questions, so please go ahead. Okay. Um, merci beaucoup. Donc, je remercie les organisateurs for their uh, invitation. Thank you very much. I wish to thank the organizers for having invited me. I hope you can hear me. And uh, I'd like to also acknowledge uh, the other speakers. I'd like to quickly share my screen. Can you see my screen yet? Okay. Um, yes. Okay. Okay. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, I would like to speak about microfinance relations or conditions, rather, which could be very beneficial for the development of African countries' economies. We talk a lot about relationships between the EU and Africa, but the production is left aside because if you don't use, if you don't manufacture a wide range of products, it will be very difficult to actually uh, wreak the profits. Now, the relationship between Europe and Africa, the relationship has not been very beneficial for Africa. And in addition to what has been said so far, let me also say that the micro finance, uh, financial environment is not really appropriate. The, 14 countries which use the French CFA, Franc plus Comores, uh, are a group of countries, but I will actually uh, limit myself to the uh, UMOR, the um, 
West African Economic and Monetary Union. In fact, we have eight countries, Senegal, Burkina, Niger, Togo, Benin, uh, Côte d'Ivoire, Mali, uh, Guinea-Bissau, Dakar, uh, sorry, Senegal. You see these uh, countries in West Africa, the others belong to Central Africa. So these countries have the same currency, the CFA franc. This currency was created in 1945 during the colonial period, and it's based on three essential pillars. The first pillar is the fixed parity with the French currency, first the French franc, and since 1999, the euro. The second pillar is the free transferability, i.e. the freedom to transfer capital and income between the countries of each TFA block and between these countries and France. Third pillar, convertibility, which is guaranteed by the French Treasury, the French uh, Ministry of Finance, which means French is uh, will uh, possibly uh, actually provide uh, some loans to the uh, BCAO, the Central Bank of West African State, and the BEAC, the Bank of Central African States. But the French government uh, will request that 50% uh, of the foreign exchange reserves be uh, entrusted to the French Treasury. After independence, it was 100%. But what this means is that the French government is represented in the bodies of both central banks with a veto right that has become implicit as time passes. In 2019, a reform was announced, but it hasn't been led very far. Just in uh, two words, let me say that the so-called French guarantee does not really exist. The French finance law from 2020 indicates here that the authorizations of commitments are zero for the West African Monetary Union, for the Central African Monetary Union, and for the Comores, Comore Islands Union. So for many years, there have not been any loan from the French treasurer. Quite the contrary, but the African countries deposited money within the French treasury. And yet, the French authorities, the French government is able to actually decide what goes on with the French franc, and yet this is going against the structural development of those countries. What I'm saying is that this currency is no longer an African currency, it's a Euro-African currency. Now, you must know that France negotiated with its uh, African counterparts a different thing. On 20th November 2018, a decision was made. What it says that uh, the, the authorities uh, of the monetary union in Europe need to be made aware whether there has been any change concerning the parity between the French franc and the uh, CFA. And generally speaking, European authorities need to be informed of any changes. Now, what I'm saying and what my argument is about is that you cannot talk about free trade if there are measures that make it that the African countries are never able to develop their economic potential. And I believe that certainly the EU needs to take into consideration the CFA franc situation because we can never have a winner, win, winning, winning, a win win situation. Now, to come back to the West African countries, if you look at the geographical share between uh, the exports, it appears that Europe is the number one economic partner. But it's actually the countries outside of the Euro zone that are main partners to UMOA, UMOA partners. Well, here you have Switzerland, which in 2020 represented 24.5% of exports from the UEMOA, whereas uh, Altogether, you can see the European Union represented 22. Now, there are uh, products from Mali, Senegal, and other countries. Imports now, you can see that Europe is the main 
a trade partner, and in particular, the European Union, and more specifically, the Eurozone, which represent 31% of imports for the UEMOA. And France is the leading countries with 14% of the imports, and its market shares have remained relatively stable since 2012. Now, what does it mean? It means that the Eurozone actually doesn't buy anything from Africa. It buys gold, cocoa. Yes, but essentially nothing in terms of manufactured goods. And yet, African countries are outlet markets for all the European products. And the European Union and the Eurozone need Africa as outlet markets. And if we uh, change things, if we liberalize trade, we're going to destroy those countries. These countries have nothing to sell to Europe, and Europe has not helped them to develop their productive capacities. And you can see here a country like France, which at global level is not very important. Uh, its exports has been reduced. But France, according to UNCTAD, is the ninth exporter. It represents 2.8% of world exports. But in the CFA francs area, it represents more than 20%. So you can see there are still very strong link between France and its former colonies. And that is due also to, to the CFA franc, which is helping France than other countries. Now, you have to make a distinction between the territorial area and the monetary area, because I've just seen, I just presented statistics to you based on graphic area. But if you look into consider, if you take into consideration who exports and imports towards West Africa and the area of CFA. As a matter of fact, it's the dollar zone because within the WAMU, trade invoice in Euro accounts for 17%, whereas the trade in Euro with France only represents 7.7% .7 of total trade of the West African Monetary Union. So from a purely economic point of view, there's no real point of having a fixed parity between the French franc and the CFA franc. This mechanism is a neo-colonial system and is no longer justified. And yet this fixed parity has very important consequences on the African economies. Why is that? It's because Euro is a very strong currency uh, becoming stronger vis-a-vis -vis the US dollar, and therefore the CFA franc also becomes stronger. And yet uh, most of our exports are labeled in the dollar currency. Now here, a book uh, written by Ali Zafar, who is a former economist of the World Bank, who wrote the CFA franc zone, economic development and the post-COVID recovery. And in his book, he explains that the CFA area in West Africa, well, the exchange rate is over-evaluated by 20%, 20%, which means you tax your exports and you subsidize your imports. What it means is that you're always experiencing a commercial deficit. You always have a trade deficit, a current trade deficit. And in West Africa, only Senegal, out of the CFA franc area sometimes have a, a trade balance which is positive. Now, all of this is down to the parity, the fixed parity. And if you look at this graph, it is the development of the euro dollar exchange rate between 2000 and July 2008. Throughout that period, the value of euro has increased against the dollar constantly. And if you look at the difference between 2000 and 2008, the value of Euro was uh, 1 to 0 0.8 to 1 to, to uh, 1.5. So this is a 90% uh, appreciation. And this was, uh, and this impacted uh, African uh, farmers. The uh, cotton sector in Burkina Faso went bankrupt for several reasons or for one main reason, i.e. the euro 
was too strong. This is a report from the De French Development Agency, and it was said that if we did not reconsider the parity uh, euro CFA franc, uh, we would even more compromise the, sec the uh, cotton sector in Africa. Because when uh, the value of euro increases vis a vis the dollar, it means that when you convert your dollars in CFA, you lose out in terms of uh, income. And these are problems are compounded by illicit financial flows because uh, they often are to do with commodities. If you look at uh, Cote d'Ivoire, they export cocoa to Germany and to France. Uh, between 95 and 2014, the illicit financial flows, uh, uh, which are actually uh, under invoiced exports, uh, amounted to 4.5 billion uh, in total, 182 million per year. And as to France, it also accounts for 28% of the total exports of Côte d'Ivoire. So as long as these countries remain in this primary specialization, they will have to fight this additional scourge. And what must be added is that in that context where the countries have deficits and trade balances and have fixed exchange rates, the only way they have is to run into debt in foreign currencies. Uh, with untenable and sustainable levels of debt. And the other way is to ration productive credit. And I'm taking the example of uh, Senegal, my country in 2019, the uh, Senegalese uh, primary sector, uh, farming, cattle raising, fisheries, uh, only uh, received 53, 53 billion CFA francs in terms of uh, mid-term and long-term loans. And by comparison, the BCAO lend to its staff, 3,000 people, 52 billion CFA francs. It means that 3,000 persons working for BCAO got loans of 52 billion, the equivalent of what the whole Senegalese private sector would receive from the banking sector, which is 2.2% of all bank loans. We, and the same phenomenon is observed in uh, other countries. And here uh, you can see that these countries are not attractive. Uh, Ghana on its own uh, received a stock of foreign investment similar to all the countries of YMU together. So this is my conclusion. This is my final slide. This table shows the interdevelopment of those countries remaining within the CFA franc area, Niger, uh, had its best income per capita in 1965 with uh, $898. Uh, currently, this per capita income is 524. So it means a difference of 71.5%. Côte d'Ivoire, the real income per capita is 43% lower than the best income level obtained in 1978, 44 years ago. If you look at Guinea-Bissau, uh, which entered the CFA zone in 1997, when they um, joined uh, that uh, area, they had the best uh, level of income per capita, 100, and now that level is 650. It means that Guinea-Bissau is worse off, 24 three percent worse off than in 1997 when they joined the uh, CFA franc area. Nowadays, uh, uh, we talk a lot about coups in Western Africa. All these take place in the franc, in the CFA franc area. Uh, in between 2002 and 2018, there were uh, 78 uh, coups or attempted coups. And all of them, except one, are in those countries, uh, these CFA franc countries, because they do not develop. As long as you have these adverse macroeconomic conditions, which are uh, destructive of development, uh, you cannot wonder that uh, international trade uh, would not um, benefit African countries. So you have to pay attention to these macroeconomic conditions. What I can recommend as a conclusion is 
that first of all that europeans invest and start thinking about the cfa frank question and that we put an end to this near system second that the apa are uh, uh, um, done away with uh, and that a cooperation agreement to strengthen uh, the uh, production capacities of uh, African countries. And we should also put an end to uh, illicit financial flows, which uh, capture part of the surplus created by African economies. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ndongo Sambasila, for the figures. Uh, I would ask all the panelists to send us their inputs being it um, graphics, being it uh, your, 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 your spoken words. And I would just give um, the Vice President of European Parliament and Standing Rapporteur for the ECOWAS region, Pedro Silva Pereira, the floor. Maybe the first comments, but probably we have to discuss much more after your introductory remarks. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Uh, good evening to you all. Um, and uh, sincere congratulations to you, Helmut, for launching these uh, debates in uh, a listening mode. Uh, it will help us for sure to produce um, a report on the, the trade and investment relations between you and Africa. And it shows how serious you are about this exercise. So. Uh, thank you for that. I also would like to thank the, um, the guests for their views, very interesting, but also showing how complex these issues uh, are. I took note of the concerns expressed. Um, also, um, uh, clear messages on the role of uh, the civil society actors in all this regarding the economic development of the West African region and also the way um, solutions for trade and investment are discussed between the African uh, institutions and uh, the European Union. Um, uh, and I agree with what was said that uh, uh, if we really want to address the challenges that we face, um, then it's not only about discussing um, uh, trade arrangements, uh, it is really discussing about um, the, the, the direction of uh, uh, a partnership between the European Union and Africa, and also the, um, the, um, the elements that uh, are decisive to reach good results. And I'm thinking about this last intervention on uh, macro financial conditions that is something that sometimes is out of the radar when we discuss this kind of issues, but uh, they are indeed very important. I agree with you, Helmut, when you said that uh, Africa is the continent of the future, and uh, for sure the partnership between the European Union and uh, Africa is of major strategic uh, importance, and uh, I hope that it can be a catalyst. It is being already a catalyst, I must say, uh, but uh, it can be even more for uh, economic growth in one hand um, and for uh, inclusive, fair and sustainable development in uh, uh, Africa. Um, this has to do with this um, uh, post continue uh, context where the partnership uh, with uh, uh, the African countries is also uh, developed. And I think that uh, uh, we have to recognize that uh, the European is making uh, a serious effort with uh, financial uh, instruments for investment, uh, uh, for cooperation for development in Africa. We know the role of uh, the European Union and the new European Union member states regarding official aid in uh, Africa, also the efforts made to address the challenges of this pandemic. Um, the particular uh, effort made regarding uh, vaccines, and of course a lot of more uh, has to be done. But uh, um, what I'm saying is that uh, uh, we have to uh, define uh, as equal partners common goals, and those have to be addressed uh, also through uh, proper uh, investment and targeted uh, investment uh, 
for the development of the West African region. Now, um, uh, it is up to you, Helmut, to give the answers to our guests through your report. So uh, I will leave you with that. But uh, um, uh, let me say two or two, three things more, in particular uh, in my position as standing rapporteur for the Economic Partnership Agreement with uh, West Africa. Um, the fundamental question is, uh, does this economic partnership agreement has a role to play uh, promoting sustainable development goals uh, in the region or not? Or, or is something that we should roll out uh, as not significant or not positive at all? Um, and uh, uh, in this respect, I must uh, tell you that uh, I don't see uh, an opposition regarding the economic partnership agreement between the European Union and the African countries or the uh, African region. The truth is that this EPA was signed uh, by 15 out of 16 countries in the West African region. It is uh, supported also by the regional institutions, the Economic Community of West African countries, States, ECOPA, and also the West African Monetary and Economic Union. Uh, so, um, it is recognized as a, a positive element for the development of West Africa. Um, uh, we can always discuss if, uh, is it sufficiently asymmetric as it should be, because in fact, uh, we have to take into account the uh, situation of uh, totally unbalanced development between the European Union and the West African region. And uh, this was uh, in, uh, shown in your, in your presentations as well, the situation of, of uh, unbalanced trade that we have. And um, uh, an EPA sufficiently asymmetric will have to allow um, a certain degree of uh, uh, protectionist uh, measures. We know that. But the, the truth is that uh, the countries that have signed in the African uh, region believe that uh, the agreement is at least sufficiently asymmetric and um, um, that uh, we can address many of the issues um, uh, that are still uh, there uh, in terms of the um, uh, future uh, relationship uh, within the implementation of the agreement and making use also of the review clause um, that is uh, foreseen in the agreement itself. And I'm saying this, um, and you will uh, agree uh, for sure, Elmut, that uh, uh, we have serious uh, um, re reservations regarding the uh, ambitions, of, uh, the, 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 the insufficient uh, ambition of the agreement in terms of sustainable development. This is an agreement that was negotiated uh, many years ago. The negotiations were concluded already in 2014. Since then, the European Union is making a much more uh, ambitious uh, uh, trade agreements in terms of sustainable development, and we want to uh, improve them even further. So, um, um, if you ask me, I'm not totally satisfied. I'm far from being satisfied with the sustainable development uh, dimension of the EPA with West Africa. We know that uh, uh, we have to look for some interpretations, uh, they are making use of the general clauses of the, cost, uh, the Cotonou Agreement so that we can uh, um, uh, establish a, an interpretation that is more favorable for sustainable development uh, goals. Um, but also we know that um, uh, in the negotiations, there was also some uh, resistance uh, uh, to have more concrete commitments in this respect. But it is, these are the kind of things that uh, we can address via um, a, a review clause. So um, uh, then I would say that we have to do much more to bring on board uh, Nigeria. And I think the European Commission is not doing enough uh, in order to strengthen the bilateral relationship with Nigeria. Um, Nigeria is, of course, the largest country and economy in the region. 
representing around 70% of the population in West Africa. Uh, it is uh, one of the countries most, most needed by this uh, pandemic. Um, and now also with the economic consequences of the pandemic, the, the energy crisis that we are seeing. And uh, uh, so uh, it is difficult to find an example of uh, an economy that really needs to uh, look for uh, diversification. And um, that means also to develop their own industries, their local uh, production, so that uh, uh, this economy can respond to the challenges. My understanding is that um, economic partnership agreements with the European Union will um, uh, promote um, and uh, help to stimulate economic reforms uh, in the direction of uh, diversification. Um, uh, but this would uh, um, not uh, uh, exclude, on the contrary, it uh, uh, asks for an additional effort from the part of the European Commission to uh, support uh, the development of these countries and of these economies, the diversification that they need. And this is a role for the um, um, uh, European Commission, of course, but it is also a role for, for the European Investment Bank. And I hope that in your report, you'll find the space to uh, recall to the European Investment Bank the, the role that the European Investment Bank can play in um, supporting the development, uh, the economic development uh, um, in the region, and in particular, the diversification of the uh, economies. Uh, I think that nothing of this is uh, contrary to the promotion and the development of the African continental free trade area. I don't see uh, an opposition there. And uh, I agree that uh, the European Union also has to do its part in terms of um, um, technical and financial assistance so that uh, an African continental free trade area can work uh, properly. And I think we can do that uh, if we define uh, really uh, common goals uh, without uh, any uh, sign of uh, colonial mentality or uh, a paternalist uh, approach. I think that's not what we uh, want here. And um, I hope that uh, um, listening to the concerns of our um, West African partners, uh, you can um, through your report, um, produce um, a positive input for this process so that uh, trade and investment uh, between the European Union and Africa uh, and West Africa can uh, be uh, an instrument uh, for sustainable development. And that's the goal that we share. So thank you for my, thank you very much for this invitation and uh, all the best for your work. Thank you, Pedro. And I guess uh, work will be in a certain way also our uh, joint uh, undertaking in the European Parliament, uh, in particular from all colleagues in the trade, uh, International Trade Committee, because you can imagine that um, concentrating on one aspect, uh, in particular the trade and commercial relations will be of course not possible to, to, to neglect what does it mean from migration to the development issues for the social cultural development and all the aspects we have heard today. So I have at least two more questions on my, on my uh, uh, desk here, I have seen it. I will at least read them out, maybe as time is really coming already uh, more than um, uh, used to the end. And uh, as we had been requested by Florian to leave our guests from, from the region to watch the football uh, game, uh, I will read out the questions maybe to our panelists. And if you agree, you can answer them in written uh, as we are also expecting your contributions for the further reconsideration of the work for our work on the, on the report, but not only on the report, but to rethink how we are um, composing, how we are structuring our future relationship from the European Union uh, with, uh, with you uh, in 
uh, in West Africa, in the other regions of Africa, because I really think it, it is high time um, to, to rethink what has been the past. The past has gone and now we have to, to construct a, a joint and, and constructive relationship for the future. So the question for, for uh, Dr. Sheikh Tijan Die, you mentioned the division of Africa by the EU and the EPAS. This division continues as Africa seeks to build a single market. At last week's event, it was proposed to suspend all EPAS and negotiations for 10 years and to ask the EU to grant all African countries market access, such as the one benefiting low-income countries through everything but arms. So what do you think, with your experience, also what you have said today, would this allow Africa to benefit from market protection against low-priced imports from the European Union until Africa has built its internal market? Huge question. Probably we have not the time to go into the details by answering them. But I think it's very worthwhile a question because it's really focusing on the question, what is the, what is the core of the future economic cooperation? And the other uh, question to Dr. Ken Ukawa, uh, Nigeria remains the main obstacle to the regional IPA not being enforced in West Africa. Moreover, Nigeria has very, very high import restrictions, especially for agricultural products, even stricter than those foreseen in the CET. The EU is pressing Nigeria to finally sign the EPA. So does Nigeria high import protection lead to a better development in agriculture production and small scale industry than for neighbors with open markets to the European Union, such as Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire or Senegal? So the question is again, how the intra-regional cooperation, economic uh, interlinkages are organized with or without EPA. And what does it mean for the political governance? How to fight corruption? How to strengthen democratic structures in the countries, which would also make it more reliable to focus on an intra-regional cooperation? I'm stopping here with the questions. I hope uh, we keep in touch, we, we, we get the answers to the two questions. Uh, I would ask um, Florian Horn from the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation to send the questions to you in written so that you have them and maybe to all the other participants as well. So we have the recording of today, you have the chance to listen to the recording of the East African community um, webinar last week. And I give the promise that we will continue next week, Wednesday, six o'clock evening uh, is North Africa on the agenda. And I promise we try to be better in the gender parity uh, composition of the panel. Um, as responsible for gender mainstreaming sometimes and the intercommittee, sometimes it's not so easy to find uh, um, the input from, from distinguished guests, I hope we keep in contact, uh, looking forward for, for a good cooperation. Thank you very much for this evening. Thank you to translators to have made it possible. And thank you uh, also for the organizers, for the co-hosts of this webinar. See you.